Yeah, um, my name is Amelia Ryan. I'm the vegetation ecologist at Pinnacles National Park. I have um, Pinnacles National Park, we'll, we'll learn about, I guess, a little in a second, um, in Central California. And um, I have been there for um, about six years. Um, as the vegetation ecologist. And um, before that, I um, was at Point Reyes National Seashore for um, about 13 and a half years. Um, so a long time there and was served on the Marin chapter while I was there. And um, I am a native California, grew up on 40 acres in um, northern or in Sonoma County, Casadero kind of near the Cedars, some of you may have been to that, to that location. Um, so um, that's a little about me. Went to UC Davis and um, San Francisco State for my master's degree. <laughs> Sounds like we have some Pinnacles fans in the audience. Okay, so let me put my share screen on. And so tonight I'm gonna talk to you about a undescribed plant species at Pinnacles that we've been working on um, figuring out what it is and trying to describe. And so I'm just gonna sort of basically share that story a little bit. And then if I have extra time, we'll talk about um, some of the, a uh, few of the other rare plants at Pinnacles and, um, and maybe some of our other work there. So let's see, okay. So I'm just going to, oh, I have to, sorry. You'd think after COVID that no one would have Zoom um, kerfuffles anymore, but I guess that's, let's, there we go. Okay, and sure. Okay, uh, can ev everyone see my screen okay? Yes, looks great. Great, Thank okay. You. okay. Okay, so a preview of the Pinnacles jewel flower and hopefully some other rare plants. And before I go on, I just want to acknowledge that this is work I am doing with my research partner, um, Dr. Eva Lucaccio from um, the UNAM um, Polytechnical University in Mexico. So you are there. Um, up in San Francisco, and and for those of you who've never been, Pinnacles National Park is um, sort of in the far South Bay area, um, roughly parallel with the Monterey Peninsula, but but inland in the inner coast ranges, and more specifically, it's in the Gavilan Mountain Ranges, um, about thirty five miles south of Hollister. And Pinnacles is known for its Pinnacles. It's that is named the name of the rock formation that is sort of an iconic um, rocks um, that was named after. And um, here's our balconies formation, very beautiful. I encourage you to, to hike up there in our High Peaks area. Has some really <laughs> steep, narrow trails put in by the CCC um, during the Works Progress Administration. And of course, it is well known for its condor program. It is the only national park, it has the only national park service uh, condor pro, run condor program, though there are many other national parks that have condors that visit them. And so we have a, a, a condor crew that spends a, a great deal of effort working on the recovery of this really cool iconic California species. And of course, um, Pinnacles is also known for its um, wildflower displays. It has quite beautiful wildflower displays in springs, especially if we get um, a little bit of rain, <laughs> a decent amount of rain in the, in the winter. We don't, um, even on years that have, um, have you know, at least you know, medium rainfall, we, we have such a diversity of flowers that you usually will, something will be showing, showing off. We don't get the giant displays like somewhere like Carrizo Plain, but we get a, a, a lovely variety um, of, of species and um, with long with with a huge variety of blooming periods. And a fun side note is that Pinnacles has the highest diversity of bee species that's ever been um, recorded per unit area, probably because as a national park, we are heavily studied, but also because we do have a phenomenal bee diversity, nearly 500 species. And um, 
And I, we think part of that is due to the diversity and long bloom period of all the different nectar sources in the park. And so some of the main habitats are chaparral, which dominates the, the park. It's our number one habitat. And then uh, oak woodland is our second most common. And we have some beautiful little wildflowers in, in, in there. Riparian is not a huge percentage of it, but the sheltered valleys have a really high um, importance for the wildlife of the park. There's wetter habitats and otherwise a very arid park. And finally, rock and scree. And I'll sort of um, include in this also a lot of sort of sand and granitic alluvium. So these, this habitat is one of our smaller, but it's actually where a lot of our rare plants occur. And um, I would say disproportionate number of our rarer species occur there. But to start this discussion of this new, of this new species, I'm going to take you um, first to, uh, to uh, our pinnacles. The story sort of starts with our, our museum herbarium. Back in, 19, in the 80s, we had a wonderful volunteer named Cecilia Bjornerud, um, who took it upon herself to kind of start the first sort of real herbarium um, for the park. And she uh, explored the park and collected many specimens in the park, including this strange little mustard plant. When she collected it in, um, in uh, I think it was, yeah, or early March, it was so poorly developed that they couldn't really identify it at all. They, they knew it was probably a colanthus, which is a little plant in the mustard family which we now call the Brassicaceae, but used to be called the Cruciferae. And when she saw it, this little plant may have looked something like this, this tiny little wispy plant with uh, no, no fruit yet, just, uh, just flowers. So she went back and collected it though, when it was uh, later, when it was flowering. And when she collected that flowering specimen, it was uh, identified as Colanthus lemony. And um, indeed, it is, uh, <laughs> I can't see, what, I think I can see, I think it says sterile cluster. Unfortunately, part of my slides are obscured by the, by the, the so let's see if I can move this. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, so it, it has this little sterile cluster, which is a, a, a feature of Colanthus lemony and, and many other um, species. Um, so, a sterile cluster is like a little top knot of sterile flowers that, that don't ever fully develop on the top of the plant that um, are used to sort of attract pollinators. So that is, is that was that, and that was a nice addition to our herbarium. Oops, I'm having a little, let's see if I can go back. Okay, so that identification of Colanthus lemony was, was a good, uh, bet it's Colanthus lemony is, is found in the area. And in fact, just a couple of years later, um, the Pacific Grove Museum botanist and curator, a wonderful botanist named Vern Yaden, um, collected um, a mature specimen of Colanthus lemony um, on Shalom Creek, um, just outside the park. Um, you can see the little map in the bottom corner, and there it's pointing to a spot along um, Metz Road, just up in Catrillon Creek, uh, where he collected it and on private property. And um, and that is the same, that that is the same creek that runs through Pinnacles. There's only one drainage in Pinnacles. It's the Shalom Creek drainage and it runs all everything in the park drains into it and then it runs out into the Salinas River and from there into Monterey Bay. Um, okay, it's I'm just going to hold on for a second for um, the, the, it seems that the PowerPoint is not responding to my forward right now. So hopefully it will move in just a second. Okay, here we go. So fast forward about nearly 20 years. Um, Pinnacles has its first botanist, whose name was Tom Leatherman. He later went on to be superintendent of John Muir and then other parks. Uh, in the region, in, in the Western United States, but um, he was looking through our herbarium and he 
thought that some of the plants may have been misidentified or needed a second look, and he put the Colanthus uh, specimens, particularly the Colanthus lemony, um, in a pile to be um, reviewed as potentially suspicious. He thought it looked more like Streptanthus insignis. So Streptanthus insignis is another closely related um, plant in the mustard family that also that is found in western San Benito County. It's a, sort of a regional endemic, so it's it's only found in a small region and the county just to the west of, uh, or just, excuse me, just to the east, eastern San Benito County, just to the east of the Pinnacles. Um, and um, it also is a, is a little um, similar looking plant, similar colors, and also has this sort of sterile cluster on top. And it wouldn't be that, that surprise if it was found a few miles further to the west from its main population. Though, um, Streptanthus and Cygnus usually is known to to occur on um, serpentine soils, which are lacking the pinnacles. So here it's important to note that what we uh, call these two genus of plants that I've mentioned so far, Streptanthus and Colanthus, are um, very closely related members of the mustard family that are kind of a complex, form a complex of species together. And recent genetic research um, by my research partner, um, Dr. Cacho, has found that, has suggested that these two genera are paraphyletic. And if you look closely, you don't need to try and absorb this very busy figure here, but what you can see if you look on the right-hand side is a lot of S's and C's all interspersed with each other, indicating that what we call a streptanthus, which means twisted flower, or colanthus, which means stem flower, is actually not a not a um, sort of distinct or not um, distinct genetically distinct uh, from each other. And so we have certain groups of things that are called colanthus or streptanthus that um, hold together, but overall those two. Um, genera are sort of scattered all throughout the tree. And so, um, and the feature of having a sterile terminal cluster actually evolved apparently independently twice. Of course, sometimes features can evolve and then be lost in some members as well. But, and so it evolved once in this colanthus clade that includes Colanthus lemony and Colanthus coltary, which are two extremely closely related members of Colanthus that used to be considered um, just for varieties or subspecies of, of coltary. Cal Colanthus californicus, inflatus, um, cooperi, and heterophilus, and then also in the Streptanthus glandulosus complex. And of course, Streptanthus glandulosus is the the species that many of us are familiar with, and this is the streptanthoid complex is a very diverse um, group of organism or, or of uh, looking diverse um, kind of inhabit and shape and flower shape um, group. Um, they have all sorts of different kind of petal shapes and colors, but a couple features of them is that they tend to um, uh, speciate very readily. There's many, many different species and varieties of them that are um, that that have formed in just small isolated populations, and they tend to be species of rocky, bare, and barren soils. And you can see a little bit at the bottom those kind of habitats where it's found. So to get back to our, our, our species, um, in 2000, the botanist hired um, uh, contract botanists Roy Buck and Glenn Clifton to review our, our herbarium and, and uh, look at the, these sort of suspicious specimens of Colanthus and a whole bunch of other things. But um, both Roy and Glenn Clifton were something of specialists in this particular um, clade. So they immediately think it looks pretty odd. It's similar, but distinctly 
different from Streptanthus cygnus, the other potential sort of species that has been proposed that this could be. Then these are pictures of, uh, here's a, a picture of, of our plant. Um, and so they, uh, Tom, as it happens, has a field crew working for him that has been finding some of these little weird Streptanthus growing in the area. And so they're able to take him that day to the population. And he, he definitely thinks it looks really different. It's got some key distinctive features. And here, here, here is the pinnacle stool flower we're looking at now. And it, and here's its habitat. It's got this very sandy kind of habitat, quite different from where the strip, the, the uh, pinnacle stool flower occurs. So he collected it for description as a potential new species. He, he's the one that first identified it as, as, as possibly something totally new. And um, meanwhile, Tom um, asked his crew to go out and they, they were able to locate several new populations over the, the next few years. But then it essentially languished for nearly, for over 15 years. And, um, and really no notable progress was made on it for a long period. So in 2007, um, I joined um, Pinnacles National Park as the vegetation ecologist coming from Point Reyes. Point Reyes has a very, um, has many, many endemic and um, rare species to it. And it has a very active and thriving rare plant program. And so when I came to Pinnacles, there wasn't at that time an active rare plant program. And so I made one of my first goals to reinvigorate the rare plant program. And so part of that was starting to map where rare plants occurred in the park. The, the, the point of this is to understand just where are they distributed and what habitats um, are they in. And to use that both for just um, avoiding individual populations and also for understanding better how to protect and avoid impacts to the futures. But also, as I started looking at a rare plant program, I, I had actually already kind of heard rumor of um, uh, this, this undescribed species and um, that had it languished uh, for, for nearly 20 years, um, still undescribed. So I did reach out to Roy, who was initially, he said he was still very interested in trying to describe it. And so we talked about working together to get to describe it. But unfortunately, um, Roy passed away in 2019, which is a loss of the botanical community. So that left us with, well, what is this species? We've got these two I, I purported IDs, this Colanthus streptanthus and cygnus and Colanthus lemony. And there's a bunch of different Shreptanthus species that are um, that are found in the area. Um, besides the, this undescribed Shreptanthus at the park, we actually have Shreptanthus glandulosus, um, the common um, uh, jewel flower, um, the bristly jewel flower, um, in our rocky. Uh, uh, outcrops in the park. And there's a number of other species found in the area, Streptanthus and Cygnus, um, Colanthus coulteri, Colanthus lemony, and um, Streptanthus brewery, Colanthus anceps, etc. So we started this project by reviewing some of these other species, Colanthus coulteri, and here I will use a Colanthus coulteri and Colanthus lemony are two very similar species that are we've it's it's sometimes a, a Colanthus lemony was just moved back out of Colanthus coulteri from being a subspecies to being its own species and so um, sometimes Colanthus coulteri when we put when we originally put this together was actually the the apparent name of um, Colanthus lemony so um, anyhow Colanthus coulteri. Um, is a, um, a, a, a a plant of sort of sandy soils that likes sandy slopes um, and drier habitats. 
um, looks fairly similar. It also has a sterile cluster. Here's that Streptanthus insignis with that very pronounced kind of rusty purple sterile cluster on the top, which again is those, those little top knots on the top of the flower and these little white, white flowers. And then Streptanthus glandulosus, that um, very common jewel flower that is actually related to many other species of jewel flower. So um, what is the, the lineage of our particular one? Well, one possibility is going back to that Streptanthus glandulosus, that species that, that is a, one of our most common widely distributed jewel flowers. That species ha, is related to a complex of, of very localized endemic species um, that are often found in very small areas, like the Mount Diablo jewel flower, found only on Mount Diablo, and the Mount Hamilton jewel flower, found only in the vicinity of Mount Hamilton, and then the slightly larger um, San Benito jewel flower. Each of these um, species are species with little sterile clusters, sterile plumes on the top, and um, that uh, that evolved from the bristly jewel flower and, li and live in very localized areas. So this is definitely a potential parent. And, and like our jewel flower pinnacles, all of these species tend to grow, and, and most jewel flowers, in these very um, rocky, um, kind of uh, low competition, poorly vegetated habitats. And this is just an example of the habitat that the um, Mount Hamilton jewel flower grows in, a photo by Aaron Schusteff. And um, so as I mentioned before, Streptanthus glandulosus is also present in the park very nearby our rare species. So that Streptanthus glandulosus is shown in triangles and our, our undescribed species is in these stars scattered about. Um, but the habitat is different. It grows only in rock outcrops, whereas our um, species grows in, in slopes of sandy or, or gravelly um, soil. Um, and then Streptanthus and Cygnus and our new species, uh, the, each of these species have pretty different leaves. I would say that uh, one feature of our new species, our potential new species, this, which is the species Nova pinnacles, is the sort of uneven leaf lobing, which is sort of similar to the Streptanthus and Cygnus compared to the, the Colanthus species, which have very even either serrations or sometimes smooth edges, but um, they tend to be sort of evenly distributed. So in order to elucidate, you know, what just this can be, we have been doing, we've, we've been growing out this species to look at it in more optimal conditions. And here on the left, you can see this is what the smaller plant here is what the pinnacles jewel flower looks like in garden conditions as compared to the Streptanthus and Cygnus, the, the um, San Benito jewel flower, which is the larger pot specimen. The leaves are pretty different. The, the Streptanthus um, and Cygnus has a much hairier leaf. And that's the one on the right. And an interesting thing about our, and our, our Streptanthus, our pinnacle Streptanthus has these sort of very narrow calyx, whereas the Streptanthus and Cygnus has a sort of more classic urn-shaped calyx, which you can see circled here. And that urn shape is kind of more along the lines of the Streptanthus glandulosus, whereas that Colanthus lemony actually like our Streptanthus, um, our pinnacle Streptanthus, or, or you know, our pinnacle's jewel flower has a very narrow um, shape to its sort of its profile of its flower. And that, that, as we started growing it, we noticed that, especially when grown in garden conditions, that sterile plume was much less pronounced in our pinnacle jewel flower than in the, for example, the San Benito jewel flower. So, um, so far in looking at our species, we've been measuring a, a, and tracking a bunch of different characteristics and comparing them to all these different species that are similar um, 
and you know potential <laughs> either potential um uh relatives or even even potentially um uh you know it could even be a mis you know like candidates for a misidentification of one of these and what we can see is that our pinnacles um jewel flower um is distinct from all of them so the red stars indicate the features that are found in the pinnacles jewel flower and where they incur in each of these species so morphologically, we're seeing some distinct similarities between all of these. And this is leading us to feel pretty confident this is probably a new, a new species or subspecies. As we've been doing this work, we've been surveying, we found um, several new populations. Um, for each little triangle, we've often found four or five smaller populations, um, but in a general sort of larger area. So to 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 um to kind of tell us hopefully you know once or for all where this um though of course nothing means ever fully once or for all and for all you know where the species lies and whether this is really distinct from um, other other species and and whether it is in this colanthus clade with the coltery and lemony or is it with our Streptanthus glandulosus? Um, is that another new, small, regional um, variety of Streptanthus, uh, you know, derived from Streptanthus glandulosus? We've been doing genetic analysis, um, and um, Dr. Cacho has been leading the genetic analysis, but we've actually had help from another, a number of other researchers, um, and including the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. And so, we don't know. I will. I will a little bit prejudice you, but telling you that I think maybe it comes from. It will turn out to be another variety of the bristly jewel flower, as I mentioned. But it does have features that none of the other ones have. One one key feature that that it has is uh, that is very similar to Colanthus coulteri, for example, is downward pointing fruit, which. Um, none of these other ones do. And so um, we are waiting for our genetic <laughs> results, which we had hoped to have done this summer um, to be completed. We expect them to be done within the week or so, at least our preliminary cut. Um, so so um, I'd hoped to be able to tell you the, the answer to this mystery <laughs> today, um, but unfortunately um, we're gonna have to wait a little longer. Um, we have we are um, hoping to to get it published soon though once we have have results. So our next steps with this species, this ninety percent sure new new species or for, or subspecies, is to um, complete our genetics, which um, and then we're also going to be working um, with uh, interns and um, seasonals this year to conduct more intensive habitat surveys and characterize its habitat um, and uh, look a little more carefully at the soil and see whether we think it could actually potentially occur outside of pinnacles and we'll be writing up that species description so the take-home message of this species is um that our preliminary morphological studies pretty strongly support pinnacles jewel flower as a distinct uh, form of jewel flower, um, different from the other jewel flowers. A really important thing is also the importance of herbaria as repositories for diversity. The fact that going through or carefully reviewing this herbarium specimen is actually what triggered our um, realization that we had a potential new species. In addition, that sample that I mentioned in the beginning that Vern Eden from Pacific Grove took is the only sample of Colanthus lemony um, that I've been able to get in the vicinity of Pinnacles. It's on private land and we haven't been able to get access is where he collected it. But thanks to that herbarium specimen that he collected, I was able to collect some tissue from it um, thanks to the Pacific Grove Museum and include it in our genetic analysis. So we can compare that, that Colanthus lemony right near the park to our species. Um, and so that has been really important. And of course, the exploration part of it, discovery and documentation 
um, of the species require it. And of course, everyone here, I'm sure, knows we only protect the diversity we know exists. So I've had a whole bunch of research partners on this project and um, and a whole bunch of other people. This is not, even though I'm I'm talking about this now and I'm part of sort of giving birth to this new species, I hope, um, it's actually been the work and um, the, 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 the expertise of many people and particularly Roy Buck and Glenn Clifton for identifying it as a new species in the first place, potential new species. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna move on to just telling you just a little preview um, of a few of the other species that we um, have at Pinnacles that I'm trying, I'm working to understand a little bit more in terms of um, how they are at Pinnacles. And I'm just gonna go briefly through just a few species just to share with you about some of these other interesting species that interest me. Let's see. Okay. And oh, I see. I'm having an issue that issue again where the, the screen is taking just a little bit to recognize when I'm telling it to go forward. Okay, this is not wanting to move forward, so we'll just see. Would you want to uh, maybe unshare and try and share again? Oh, there you go. Here it goes. <laughs> well, here's a picture of a rare plantathon we had earlier this year. Um, that was a wonderful event. We had a bunch of um, tiny plant loving botanists. The, the focus of this plant was to find more populations of the pinnacles dual flower and also to focus on any other rare species, but particularly a little group of, a, a group of um, species, which is what everyone's looking at here, which is Nemocletus. So um, one species of special interest to me is this Robin's Nemocletus. Robin's Nemocletus, um, is a very tiny little plant that um, is very adorable when you look at it close, but is only about, usually about two inches tall, two to three inches tall and a very wispy tiny thing. Once you see it, it's very pretty, um, but very hard to see initially. It loves sort of fine sandy soils and um, was known for, a, very few populations. And in fact, some of the populations that it is known from are very likely according to Nancy Morin, who's the expert on the genus um, misidentifications. Um, because there is a, a, a group of very tiny nemocletus that have been rampantly misidentified or, or were all initially lumped into another species. And so this one was was um, was not on our plant list, but was known from a uh, herbarium vouchered specimen that was at the mouth of the park. And when I started working here, uh, my partner Ryan O'Dell and I went out and we found it growing right where the herbarium specimen has been. And since then we've been working to find where it grows um, in the park. And so here's just sort of showing um, a, a picture of it. This is often what you're looking at. And there's my, my Nikon uh, lens cap in the back and you can just see it's a very tiny little plant. It had a handful of populations, but as I said, several of them were suspicious populations, very few good um, populations. But, and Pinnacles is the northernmost known population. So through this, we've been able to find actually dozens and dozens of populations. And we've discovered that it is in fact, quite a common plant around pinnacles. And this is, I think, a species and a genera in general that suffers from being hard to see and so it's often overlooked. Now interestingly, when I was working on this species, I went, I was going through pictures and I found this beautiful picture taken by a former park employee and wonderful botanist named Kier Morse, who um, 
took this picture and posted it as one species, I think Nemocletus gracilis. And um, afterwards, Nancy Morin, I believed, um, contacted him, told him that this was actually Nemocletus ramosissimus. This other Nema, this other tiny Nemocletus was also not known from the park, not on our park list, not on our radar at all, and was only through re reviewing Calflora photos and finding that there was something listed as occurring at Pinnacles and reaching out to Kieran and hearing that, yes, indeed, this was definitely taken at Pinnacles and this was definitely something he saw there, but it had been identified years later based on this photo that we were able to figure out this probably grew in the park. And um, thanks to that, we, we got a group of people together and were able to survey um, in the park and actually re relocate and identify and confirm that yes, this species does indeed occur at pinnacles. It's a it's a slightly more widespread species. It's quite wide, it's quite common in Southern California, but pinnacles is again at the very northern end of its range. And here you can see we were we we uh, we found several little individuals there at the park. So that was pretty exciting. And then one of our other our, our other um, rare species um, is the pinnacles buckwheat. Though it's called the pinnacles buckwheat, this very rare plant is known for, is known from a few other populations outside of pinnacles. Um, so you can see it's got quite a bit wider distribution um, than just pinnacles, but it's still a pretty it's pretty it's still a pretty small area, and. Um, this area, this species is especially common after burns. Now at Pinnacles, we have not had a burn in, in a large burn for about 50 years in the most of the park, in about 30 years in, in, in parts, most. So um, though, though overall, all, um, it will, it's probably a species that, that would be much more common um, if we, if we, we probably see a much wider distribution of the species if we had a burn, but we're actually finding that's much more common than we previously thought in the park. That's another one. And it's a really pretty one. This little annual one is a, is a, again, another small little one that likes sandy, sandy openings, um, that same sort of bare low competition uh, habitat. And it's a very, but it's a very pretty showy little, little plant. And, and this is the, the, it growing in this habitat in this picture. And finally, the fourth species that we've been able to discover is actually much more widespread than we realize is this high hospital canyon larkspur, which is has a um, uh, which pinnacles is actually at the southern end of its known range. And um, it is um, we found it in in almost all of our canyons. So we've actually found that it's quite abundant in the park. We've probably found about oh, 100. 50 populations of it so far. It's been a real success. So um, if you are interested, we would be in, in volunteering. We are, we do actually um, have several volunteers who've been responsible for helping us find many of these species and also work on a number of other projects. And um, besides the rare plant program, we do have a number of other programs, a basic weed program, I'm working right now on a valley oak study to characterize the regeneration um, of our parks uh, valley oaks and also um, where they're regenerating and, and where they're not, essentially. A native prairie restoration, fungal inventory, we're getting our herbarium, our important herbarium added to a statewide database. We're joining the California Phenology Network. We'll be doing some, we're working with some of the uh, local tribes to try to, to work on some uh, land management of um, ecologically meaningful plants. That's it. Um, so if at this point, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Nice. That was a, that's a really fun uh, detective story there. <laughs> Amelia. We're uh, really interested to find out the who done it. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> yeah, I, I, as I said, I had hoped that I would actually know, know the final answer by now, but we've just been waiting with bated breath for, for the genetics to be finished. There's been a huge backlog that's still, still the result of COVID really putting many, many 
um, universities and um, and sort of the sort of you know like labs on on uh, with huge backlogs. So very cool, very cool. Yeah, if you've got uh, some a little bit more time, there's a number of uh, good questions in here. Sure, uh, I can take a few you want to take a look at them yourself, or would you like for us to? Uh, well, let's see. To... Yeah, I I have a question as yeah. well. Go ahead. Um, I was curious as to whether you know how the um, the plant is pollinated. Is it a insect? It's insect pollinated for sure. Yeah, and be um, so how. How do you finance? Oh, how to do slow? <laughs> okay. So, um, yes, it, it be, uh, I've observed it being insect pollinated because we did do a gar, it did do a, um, garden experiment or essentially where we grew it in pots. That's what I mean by garden. And, um, I, I've seen, um, um, bees and it, but they, it would seem to be generalist pollinators. So native, native bees, but generalist species um yeah so it's more likely that the uh uniqueness of it is due to some habitat preference rather than a pollinator yes i think so yep yeah. yeah cool so susan mulaney asked are any of the populations near hiking trails how can i see them um well we don't generally just like outright publicize where rare plants are necessarily but if you're interested in volunteering <laughs> Uh, I could train you on how to find it. There's not really that, there's not really any that are right along hiking trails. And so you, you kind of have to go off trail a little bit into, into some habitat to find it. So, um, yeah, so it doesn't generally grow right along. I can't think of any populations that are right along any trails. Um, Denise Louie asks, how do you finance DNA testing and who does it? Okay. This was, the, the DNA testing for this was financed uh, with a grant from the Western National Parks Association who um, was listed on the funding, little side that had funding. And uh, we applied for a research grant from them. And um, the actual, the initial analysis is done by a lab working with the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. And then um, Evalu will actually, um, take the raw data and put it into her, um, into her um, database with all the other genetic information that she has already run for the uh, species. And then that's how she'll determine um, th where it sits within the, within the clade. And then, um, and then other ways to finance it, it's usually through either um, applying for um, grants within the park service or with external organizations. So DNA testing is generally not financed out of our regular budgets. It's a sort of a special project. Which, um, and then Bob Hall asks, um, are there any jewel flower species that may have been separated by the fault line that ended up in the second half of Pinnacles in Southern California? <laughs> That's a fun question. Pinnacles has a sister formation, which is the Ninach um, craters or Ninach area, and that's in the transverse range. And they were pulled apart millions and millions of years ago. Um, I, I think essentially, no, there's not any sort of sister taxa that are known from down there. And I think that this is potentially a more recently evolved than probably more recently evolved than that, than that. No, I think it was about maybe, I, I can't remember for certain, but I feel like it was like around 200 million years ago that um, pinnacles and the pinnacles and the knee match formation were together. Okay. Also, do these jewel flowers have specialist pollinators? To my knowledge, not, not for these ones. And then Charlie Russell asks, if I have had only one opportunity in a year to visit Pinnacles, what would be the best time to see wildflowers and what trails and areas? Okay, probably April is the best time of year to see wildflowers. I would advise that you try to come in on a weekday if you can, and if possible, figure out when the main spring break breaks are and avoid those times because it tends to be incredibly busy during spring break and during the weekends, especially in April and parking 
fills up very quickly, usually by 9 a.m. in the park. And so um, if you have any ability to come in, um, uh, come either very early or come during the week and maybe a little bit later in April or in March, earlier in March, then um, then that's probably better. But yes, April is probably the best time for flowers. Um, but March is beautiful. May is beautiful. Actually, June has many flowers too. But if you start coming in June or even later May, you have to be really cognizant of how hot it gets in, pic in pinnacles and remember to kind of plan for heat and plan for thinking about how much exposure you're going to have if you're going up in, especially into the high peaks areas and things like that. It's really, really big. And then finally, Vernon Smith notes that new species can still be discovered even in well botanized areas. Mount Burdell in Marin County uh, has a newly described Streptanthus, Streptanthus anomalous. Yes, and this is like a very cool Streptanthus. Uh, Doreen Smith, I believe, is the one that identified and found it. And that's another really cool Streptanthus species that was found kind of in a, a highly, a very popular um, park. That's real. Very cool other example of a, another recent Streptanthus species. Um, we we also had a, a question in the um, chat. The chat. Um, Peter Bay asked if there are any morphologically intermediate plants in the populations. Mm, there's no plants that seem to be morphologically intermediate with any of the other known Streptanthus slash Calanthus species. Um, they are, um, well, there are some features that, that, that are slightly variable at times uh, in individuals, but they don't seem to be clearly morphologically intermediate. The one feature that might count is that the, the degree of a sterile cluster at the top seems to be variable. And so that could be, a more considered a morph morphologically intermediate. I've seen a couple plants where the the um, the fruit don't point down. They're like point like more like that. But generally speaking, I think those are just like uh, not. Those are just some other little thing going on. Since I would say like it overall, um, almost all of them tend to have their their fruit point down and. I think with any individual, you know, there can always be some some weird thing that happens to one one particular fruit or one or two. So a very small amount of variation doesn't seem to be. Seems like that's fairly stable. Those are that's the features, and then uh, the leaves actually are kind of similar to the Streptanthus. I think they're similar to the um, Streptanthus glandulosus leaves, but leaves are so. Um, they're, they can be so variable in many of these Streptanthus and Calanthus that you don't want to put too much on sort of like leaf shape overall. So, but when they look, when they're babies, they look very similar to Streptanthus glandulosus, which I think is telling. Cool. And if you got uh, one more, can we ask one yeah, more? Yeah, one more. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, John's asking, are volunteers weeding around rare plants at Pentacles to allow expansion? or is the substrate soil keeping non-natives out? Yes, generally speaking, we're not weeding around rare plants because we actually have in the core of the park, it, it's been a park, the, the park which was is now a national park, but it, the core, the center of the park was set aside as a national monument in 1908. And it's actually not all that weedy, there's a few exceptions. And so we don't rare, we don't, weed around any rare plant populations. The one species that occurs in areas that are weedy is um, the Delphinium uh, californicum um, subspecies Ontarius. And, um, but there we have our target weeds that we weed, whether they're around a, a rare plant or not. Of course, if they're around a rare plant, we try and be a little more careful, though you don't really need to with that Delphinium too much. Um, but, and we try not to step on it, obviously, but um, it doesn't, the, the weeds, because it's sort of like kind of rhizomatous spreader, the weeds don't tend to grow as much under it. 
uh, bud. And then so most of our most of our um, most of our rare plants like bare sandy kind of gravelly soil that doesn't tend to have as as many weeds in it. So we haven't generally had to weed around any plants or have that be a strategy. We just have our target weeds that we go after and we, we're more careful if there happens to be a rare plant in the area where they're growing. Very cool. Well, Amelia, thank you so much for this talk. It was really, really fascinating and uh, we greatly appreciate your service to science down there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And we'll it's be, always fun to, to share stuff. <laughs> and we'll be looking for the uh, results, too. Yeah, I'm me sure too. <laughs> All right. Good I've luck. been uh, I hope like you got emailing every week about it. <laughs> Do you get to name it? <laughs> I get to be a part of, of naming it if we, okay. if we once we write it. So. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be looking for it. Good luck. All right. That. And Take thanks care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.